Hey everybody, this is Miss Fanta from Andrew Johnson. Today I'm going to be reading along the Santa Fe Trail with you all, and it matches perfectly with what we're doing in this module about the Wild West. So it's called Along the Santa Fe Trail by Marianne Russells, and it's a story of her own. This gives a little bit of background information, and we're going to allow you to read that independently. I'm not going to sit here and read through that with you. We're going to go straight into the story. It gives us some visual details. We've got this wonderful map here that shows us what that trail looks like. And our story starts here. My stepfather, Mr. Mahoney, was an experienced scout, but he was killed by the Indians while on a scouting expedition on the prairies. I remember mostly my mother and Hal. When the news came, she leaned against the wall for support, one hand clutching at her throat as if she were choking. I remember the horror in her eyes. After my stepfather's death, mother, Will, and I waited two long years in Kansas City for grandfather to come from California and take us there. He said we might wash out much gold if we cared to, but we waited in vain. There, or I'm sorry, that was the year of the cholera epidemic, and grandfather and both of his sons died in it and were buried in faraway California. When school closed in the spring of 1852, mother decided that we would go to California anyway, so we moved to Fort Leavenworth in Kansas, where immigrant trains prepared to travel west. Mother had planned that we were to take passage in Captain Francis Xavier Aubrey's train, for some of the Indians were hostile along the Santa Fe Trail, and she had great confidence in him. Two army officers and a doctor offered Mother, Will, and me transportation as far as Fort Union in New Mexico. Territory if Mother would prepare their meals en route for them. Mother agreed. She saved the $500 fare by cooking for the young men. And there's a picture of them waiting. The dread cholera was raging in Fort Leavenworth. The October day, our white-hooded wagon set sail on the western prairies. Captain Aubrey broke camp first. His great wagon swayed out into the trail. We heard his powerful voice calling orders to follow. Wagon after wagon rolled onward. The train numbered 500 wagons. Tar barrels were burning in the streets to ward off the cholera, and clouds of black smoke drifted over us as we pulled out. After a few days on the trail, we settled into a familiar pattern. Each morning, the camp was astir at daybreak. Men began rolling out from under the wagons where they had been sleeping. They stood up in the cold morning air to stretch their arms and to rub their eyes. Through partially closed tent flaps and wagon curtains, women could be seen slipping their dresses over their heads. I found curtains. Oh, I'm sorry. I found it hard to button all the buttons that ran up and down the back of my dress. Why couldn't they have been put in front where I could get at them? Will sometimes helped me, for Mother was busy cooking. Dressed and out in the sunshine, we were all happy. Sunbonnets bobbed merrily over cooking fires, and a smell of coffee was in the air. Packing was done swiftly, and the mules hitched to the wagons. Then the children were counted and loaded. Drivers called, Get up there! Come along, boys! Whips cracked, and all about the heavy wagons began groaning. The mules leaned into the collar, and the great wheels began their steady creaking. And here's a picture of them getting ready to leave out the next morning. The man in charge of our wagon was a Frenchman called Pierre. He almost always walked, but at times he sat swinging his booted feet over the dashboard, perilously close to the brown mule's swinging hips. Sometimes he sang or talked in French to the mules. His limp black hat turned straight up in the front. His blue shirt was dotted thickly with little white stars. His dark eyes were like a hawk's eyes, and his nose was like a beak. Will, who was nine, usually walked with Pierre. He tanned in the sun, and there seemed boundless energy in his slender body. Mother sat erect on the spring seat, her face rosy in the depth of her bonnet. 
Frequently she knitted as we bumped along, and often as meal and camp time drew near, she sat there and peeled potatoes. Our food and cooking things were kept in a great box at the rear of the wagon. Two blackened kettles and a water pail hung from the running gear. And there's a little picture of a basket and her knitting gear. And here they are on the wagon. He's walking there next to the mules and horses. Hmm, we can't see that very well, can we? I was seven on this trip, and I could not keep up with Will and Pierre. Often, when I got tired, I would crawl back among the blankets where I would play with my doll or fall asleep. Each noon, we would halt for a brief hour's rest. The lunch was a cold one. The mules fed on the crisp buffalo grass while the drivers rested. There they are, resting. I remember the tired men lying under the shade of the wagons, their hats covering their faces as they slept. I can see the tired, sweaty mules rolling over and over in the grass, delighted to be free from the heavy wagons. After the noon rest, we would go on again until the sun was low in the west. There they are taking their break. The vast open country that has gone from us forever rippled like a silver sea in the sunshine. Running across that sea of grass were the buffalo trails. Narrow paths worn deep into the earth. They were seldom more than eight inches across and always ran north and south. A buffalo is a wise animal. It knows instinctively that water flows eastward from the, away from the Rocky Mountains and that the nearest way to running water is always north or south. Scattered along the buffalo trails were the buffalo wallows, small lagoons of rainwater like turquoise beads strung on a dark brown string. They were made by buffalo bulls fighting. The bulls would put their heads together and slowly walk around and round, making a depression that caught the rainwater. Always there were buffalo. Our trail often led among herds of buffalo so numerous that at times we were half afraid. Look at all the buffalo. Let's see where we can get this, where we can read it well. At sunset, the prairie sky flared into unbelievable beauty, with long streamers of red and gold flung out across it. Each night, there were two great circles of wagons. Inside each great circle, the mules were turned after grazing, for ropes were stretched between the wagons and a circular corral made. The cooking fires were inside the corral. See, they have them all lined up, going in a circle. Between the two night circles formed by the wagons was a no-man's land, which the children used as a playground. The ball games that went on there, the games of leapfrog and dare base. And sometimes far away, we heard the war whoop of the Indians. Men stood on guard each night, rifles in hand. They circled and recircled the big corrals. After the evening meal, we would gather around the little fires. The men would tell stories of the strange new land before us, tales of gold and of Indians. One night, when the wind was blowing, Captain Aubrey came and held me on his lap. I felt the great black night closing down upon us and heard the voice of the night wind as it swept across the turbulent prairie. I shivered in the captain's arms, thinking that only in the circle of the firelight that flickered on Mother's face was their warmth and comfort at home. While most of the drivers slept under the wagons, the women and children slept inside the wagons or in tents. Each night we pitched our tent close to the wagon and it spread its dark wings over the three of us. It was easy to hear Pierre snoring outside. Our bed on the matted grass was comfortable, but sometimes in the night I would awaken to hear the coyote's eerie cry in the darkness. Then I would creep close to mother. There they are around the campfire. Our long caravan loaded with heavy, valuable merchandise to be sold in the west traveled slowly. 
Sometimes we were alarmed by the Indians. Sometimes we were threatened by storms. And always, it seemed, we suffered for want of water. I remember so clearly the beauty of the earth and how, as we bore westward, the deer and the antelope bounded away from us. There were miles and miles of buffalo grass, blue lagoons, and blood-red sunsets, and once in a while, on the lonely prairie, a little sawed house, the home of some hunter or trapper. We paused at Pawnee Rock and Camp Mackey. Then we moved on. Babies were born as our wagons lumbered westward. Death sometimes came. And here's a picture of them at a burial site along the way. After about a month, we were on the Cimarron cutoff. We built our fires with buffalo chips. My chore was to gather the chips. I would stand back and kick them, then reach down and gather them carefully for underneath living big spiders and centipedes. Sometimes scorpions ran out. I would fill my long, full skirt with the evening's fuel and take it back to Mother. It was on this trip that I made my first acquaintance with the big hairy spider called a tarantula. They lived in holes in the ground. When we found such a hole, we would stamp on the ground and say, Tarantula, tarantula, come out, come out. Tell us what it is all about. And sure enough, they would come out walking on stilt-like legs. As we continued in a southwesterly direction, there was less and less forage for, for our mules and horses. We found rattlesnakes and a variety of cactus that resembled trees. Sometimes little jeweled lizards would dart across our path. Birds with long trails would walk the trail before us. The drivers called them roadrunners. Once we traveled for two whole days without water, and, thir a and thirsty child though I was, I felt sorry for the straining mules than for myself. Captain Aubrey told us how the muddy water in the buffalo wallows had often saved human lives. One dying of thirst, he said, does not stop for gnats or impurities. Mother Will and I had to wash our faces and hands in the same basin of water. Will washed last, for Mother said he was the dirtiest. So here's a roadrunner that they've seen. Looks a lot different from the cartoons whenever I was a kid. After we had traveled for what seemed like an eternity across the hot, dry land, we awoke one morning to find the air filled with a cool, misty rain which lasted all day. In the late afternoon, we reached a flat mesa. There were a dozen Indian lodges there, and we saw smoke issuing from the tops. We saw Indian children slither through the wet drizzle among the stunted cedar trees in the lodges. Somehow, it seemed we had entered a strange land of enchantment. This was different from anything we had seen. Captain Aubrey told us we were now in New Mexico territory. This is the land, he said, where only the brave or criminal come. But it is a land that has brought healing to the hearts of many. There is something in the air of New Mexico that makes the blood red, the heart to beat high, and the eyes to look upward. Folks don't come here to die. They come to live. And they get what they come for. So there they are at the Indian campground. We were a bit over two months reaching Fort Union in New Mexico. There, our great cavalcade rested. The tired mules were turned out to graze on the prairies. Freight was unloaded and 200 horses turned into the corral. Army officers perched on the fence to look over and choose their horses. The ground was a shambles of buffalo hides, Mexican blankets, and sheep pelts, things to be sent back east. Let me get that where we can see it. Hmm, that's not going to work for us. Our camp was outside the Fort Union gate that stood open, and all day, Will and I, Went up as we pleased. Two friendly Indians sat and played mumbledy peg on a spread blanket. Will joined them and lost all his marbles. There they are playing. 
When the mules had rested, we struck the westward trail again, starting out on a cold December morning. We were in Santa Fe before we knew it. We passed through a great wooden gateway that arched high above us. We moved along narrow alley-like streets, past iron-barred windows, 